Welcome to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm your host, Scott Bernstein. We have a really exciting interview right now. Uh, you can see the man of the hour, uh, Paul Manning. He is a famous mob buster from Canada. He's originally from Great Britain. But um, Paul did some very, very um, important, critical, undercover work. Uh, into the Magadino crime family, uh, the Hamilton, Ontario wing of it. And he hasn't done a lot of interviews, and uh, we're excited that he's decided to come on and, and help us with our Buffalo and, and Canada reporting. Paul, thank you so much for uh, jumping on. More than welcome. So yeah, just I'm going to open it up to you, man. Just tell everybody, like, you started in, in Great Britain, uh, working law enforcement, working undercover. And then you made your way to the uh, at North America into Canada uh, about 20 years ago. Just kind of tell people your your journey. Yeah, I um, I, I started at 18. I started in the military police. Um, I went out to Northern Ireland for a couple of years, then uh, general police duties, and and then I got on a, an undercover team. Um, and we were quite a unique team. Uh, worked covert operations throughout the UK. Um, we'd be effectively loaned out to regional crime squads and to local police constabularies and we just work all over the country and we did a lot of stooging as well we did some work for mi5 and some other agencies where we'd go in and, and teach them um and we were we were responsible for a lot of the uh, a lot of the work that went on uh within especially the lowest stuff the test purchase stuff rather than the level one undercover operations we were responsible for all of the stooging and and uh and training uh, we also did surveillance and, and counterintelligence and some other stuff as well. Um, nice little unit, nice little team. Uh, I, learned, I learned my skill set there. Um, I went to the Met 98. Um, I worked for, um, I went straight into undercover work there, although not many people knew. I worked straight for professional standards undercover. Went through Hendon, normal training, and I went through uh, my probation, uh, all the while reporting back to professional standards. And I've got to be honest with you, it was pretty pretty clean police service for, for all the bad bad, uh, bad publicity to get. It was um, it was a unique place to work, especially the center of London. Different uh, different than when you got to Hamilton, right? I'm not I'm, I don't mean to be no. uh, giving away the lead here, but you had your issues with the the police in Hamilton. I, I think I'm always going to have my issues with the police in Hamilton. Uh, that's why I'm in Florida. Uh, <laughs> their arms don't reach this far. Um, yeah, Hamilton was. You know what? I think it started off um, professionally, but low-level test purchases. Um, they had a couple of nuisance premises they wanted to close down. One was the Stout Sandbar. One was the Smoke. Uh, sandbar was a crack house. It was, it was hard to get into. Um, we tried numerous times. I think it took us 24 hours when I finally got my feet on the ground. Uh, I made it in there and made purchases. Um, and up in Smoke was pretty easy, but the, the, uh, the guy that ran up in Smoke was a friend of Mark Emery, I don't know whether you know that name. Uh, Mark was uh, was the one that was caught selling, I believe, selling seeds down in the US from Canada. Got arrested, and uh, but Chris was a, a friend of his, and, and it didn't matter what I did, I, I couldn't get Chris to sell to me uh, because he didn't sell. He he wasn't uh, he wasn't a drug dealer. Um, sandbar we got into in about I, I want to say 24, 48 hours. I was in there making purchases, um, and then I think somebody recognised the fact that I actually. I, I actually could do what I, I, I promised I could do. And they sort of directed us down to the Italian community down on uh, James Street North in Hamilton, which is where you find the, the Papalias, the Violis, the Mustanos, the Lupinos. Uh, as you're probably well aware, the Lupinos, Violis, uh, yep. and the Papalias tied into uh, Mike Diano over in, uh, in, in Buffalo. But I, I didn't really have that much dealing with the Buffalo crime families. Um, they're more of a satellite family. They, they, uh, from from what I, I gathered when I was undercover, um, they take very little risk and they just take all the money from the Golden Horseshoe, because you've got you've got twelve million people from Ottawa all the way down to Niagara Falls in Canada, which is a lot of people in a small area. Um, and Canada's boring. <laughs> it's not like the US. Uh, there's nothing to do. So um, there's a lot of gambling. There's a lot of drugs. There's a lot of uh, prostitution, and. And the mafia play a big part in uh, in um, in facilitating those those habits. So you, um, were, you were working undercover in the Lupinos or in the um, Violis? 
Or I mean, all, they're, they're kind of the same. I, it's kind of the same I, only thing. Met, I only met Don Viola twice. Um, and I, I tell you now, probably the smartest criminal I've ever met, ever met, ever met in 30 years. Uh, the guy is smart. I, he got arrested for fence and all. And he got arrested because, not because he wasn't smart, but because they had... Um, you put a wire on him. Oh, they, they had somebody in the crew that was uh, that was working for the FBI. Um, but he was sent up by the Tenardo crime family. He wasn't sent up by the FBI and and uh, and Viola didn't do his background. He was actually sent up by the Tenardo crime family to uh, to go and work with Viola. You're saying you're so you're saying that a Buffalo the, somebody from Tadaro's got placed with uh, Don Violi over in Hamilton, and without Violi knowing it, that person was cooperating. Yeah, and the Tadaro's didn't know either. Um, okay. But, it was it was actually as far as UC operation as far as agent led operations go, it was actually really well done by uh by the mounties and by the uh the FBI. Uh and I think a lot of police services were involved in that. Um because most of it was, was obviously most of the work was generated in Hamilton. Uh the only police service that wasn't involved was Hamilton. Uh and there's a reason behind that. Um their um their corruptibilities well known throughout uh, throughout uh, Ontario and definitely, definitely by the Buffalo Police and, and New York State Police and um, it's not like it's a, a it's not like it's a well kept secret. So when do you first meet Don Violi? I mean, how long did it take you to get to the point where you were in a room? He, he was a, he was an accidental meet. Uh, oh, can you can you tell us? We, we, we were infiltrating a, a family called the, uh, the Mustanos. Uh, and that worked out pretty well because at the same time I was infiltrating the Pinos and the Papalias. Um And I'd go and have sit-downs with um, uh, with uh, Frankie and Rocky Papalia. Um, and I'd get out and the Mustano family wants to know what we were talking about. And, you know, it's none of their fucking business. <laughs> uh, and that, that, that was the best part about it. And after a while, people stopped asking why I was sitting down with the Papalias or why I was sitting down with the Pinos or what I was doing with Tony or what I was doing with Ainge or... Uh, because it was, it was. I made it clear that the answer was going to be, you, you don't, you don't find out. Uh, there was one character. He was called. Um, his name was Andrew. Uh, he was tied in with the Papalias, uh, tied in a long time with the Papalias, but in not Italian. Uh, and he was. Um, his street name was Repeat, because anything you told him, you guaranteed everyone would find out. So I'm the best it. friends with him. I, I hung with Drew for for quite some time and. Anything that I wanted to, to feed back to the bad guys, I give to him, and I know they'd, uh, they'd find out about it. So, uh, if we got cigarettes off customs, if we got uh, alcohol off customs uh, that we wanted to sell on the street that was seized at the border, we'd take it off customs and we'd sell it and we'd, we'd purport it to be uh, stolen. If we got anything like that, we'd, um, we'd, uh, I'd tell repeat when I come along, and then I'd get, I'd get knocks on the door within five minutes. Um, so, yeah, if you, uh, you want something spreading, you've you got to repeat. Um, but uh, the Mustanos were the target, the operational target. They were they were still inside. Uh, they were due to get out. I think October the tenth or something like that, two thousand six. And you're you're talking about Angelo and um, Pat, that were the leaders Pat, of the Pat, Pat and Ange. They were inside for a homicide. Or they was they were inside for a conspiracy to commit. They rape. killed Johnny Papalia. They 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 weren't in jail for that, but yeah, they they um, they set Murdoch on Papalia, uh, Barilaro, and uh, uh, some some poor guy called the Gucci. Um, he was a he was a caretaker. He fell in big gambling to Dominic Mustano, who was the old man. Mm -hmm. And that's Dominic was old school, Calabrese, mm -hmm. um, Southern Italy mafia. Come over, uh, brought over with his father from um, from the old old, old country, uh, and not somebody you owe twenty five grand to. And you got to remember back then this was eighty, I think eighty nine when they slotted uh, Gucci. Um, he was he was a caretaker. He wasn't a bad guy. He didn't deal drugs. He didn't. He just had a family. He was a family man, and uh, they killed him on his on his driveway. They they shot him with a submachine gun straight through the head. Um, but that was a warning. It was a it was a an indication to others that you don't pay your debts. You uh, you pay them you pay them one way or another. Um, so yeah, the Mustanos were the the goal. The goal was that uh, I infiltrate the entire community, get as many offences as possible. On as many people as possible, and then when the Mustanos get out, I entrench, my, entrench myself with them and and put them straight back in jail. That was the idea. And in the end, so, we didn't need to. <laughs> wait, well, they people that are watching this are are pretty well versed uh, on the 
what's going on in Canada. So you start working the Musitanos, and this is when they're coming out in the 2000s after they'd been in for about 10 years. Um, I think I think they got an eight-year sentence. They were they were due out ten memory, don't obviously my memory's not the best. October the 10th, 2006, I think they were due out. And our operation, we were there, we were ready to ready to go. Our operation was compromised. I want to say September the 20th. So just a month before. Coincidentally. So did you get any uh, undercover work into them before it was compromised? I mean, I know no, they weren't even out no, yet. No, not, not Pat and Ange. Not Pat and Ange. Um, so were you still working the Masatanos when they came out? Just you weren't close? No, the, the, just... the, oper the operation was compromised. The, the Masatano family, crime family, this was compromised with two brothers. Um, I guess I what I'm asking about is it was it compromised to the point where it was cancelled or it was compromised to the point where you were oh, just yeah. it was it was a it was a breach of intelligence. It was the um the Ontario Provincial Police uh lost a laptop that had my my undercover credentials on it, but also had my my private credentials on it, my home address. Wow. Um I've never never known that in any any operation I've I've done before. I've never known the uh those those two um those two sets of information to be on the same system, especially when it comes to undercover work. Right. Um, you know, I don't even know why this guy had my my home address. So apparently, it was stolen from a vehicle uh, in Ottawa. Uh, we've now discovered that it wasn't. It was uh, taken from a parking lot in uh, uh, Aurelia, which is where the OPP headquarters are. And we just left it there drunk one night in the parking lot and lost it. Uh, they bought the laptop back off the uh, the Bloods in Toronto. Like it found its way down there because uh, these laptops, especially the intelligence laptops, are worth an absolute fortune to the to the bad guys. Mm -hmm. um, it's just a trade. If you can get into them, it's a treasure trove. It uh, tells you everything: surveillance records, uh, intel records. It just gives you everything. So it was a big big deal to get it back. But once once it was lost, um, we got a knock at the door. A tactical were outside waiting. This was my home address. I had family over from the UK. They were put on a plane back to the back to the UK the same day. Um, um, I was given my gun and told that I was twenty four seven and never to leave, never to leave my gun. And then we uh, we went on the run for a bit, the wife and I. Wow. Um, what point do you migrate back to the undercover world? From there? Yeah. Oh, I don't. You don't. That was the end no, of your undercover. That, 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 that was that. That final two years was was the nail. You know what? We, we had so many close calls. We had so many uh, incidents where perhaps other people might have died. Um, we had so many um, breaches of intelligence that uh, I, I was sort of not happy, but I was sort of um, sort of glad that um, I didn't have to suffer it anymore because you, you did. You genuinely you you had to watch everything you said around the cover team around intelligence officers and, and I, by april uh, 2006 i sort of i sort of guessed we were being sold out because the the bad guys were coming up to me and telling me hey paul be careful it's, uh we believe they, they were saying this enemy. to you they were saying this to you thinking you're a bad guy oh yeah yeah right. yeah i mean we we put a we put a camera in and the, the tech guy that put the camera in, he put in a lamp post across the street from uh one of the italian clubs uh where we used to frequent and I held that thing before he put it in, and I couldn't see the camera. And I worked tech. I used to put cameras in as well. It, it was a beautiful job. And he put it in at three o'clock in the morning. And the very next day, uh, I was told the cops put a camera in across the road. Um, we we had a we had we had more than one compromise. It wasn't just the uh, the dirty inspector that went to jail. We had we had other people that were compromising this operation as well. So at what point? Are you getting FaceTime with Don Violi, even though it was accidental? Like, is this in the early 2000s? And this is around met that time? I met him. I met him. No, this is this is the same operation. Okay. Uh, you, you can imagine. I was running. I, I was running maybe. It, it, imagine a, an undercover operation. I was running maybe eight at the same time. So I was running the Hells Angels. I was running the Bloods. I was running the uh, the Crips. I was running the Pinos, Palias. Um, and I was getting quite a name for myself. Um Everybody knew who I was. So they knew. They knew the 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 the, uh, the Englishman. They called me the Englishman. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it started off as English and then it turned into the Englishman. Uh, I was doing a drug deal with um, a guy called Jed's black guy from Jamaica, 
Um, and I've done a few deals with him. And uh, nice guy, apart from the drug dealing part. Nice guy. Uh, and he'd been in jail, one of the guys that I knew. And um, the dreads came over in front of one of these guys and give me a hug. And he said, hey, English man. As in, hey, English man, how are you doing? Right. Right. And then it turned into Englishman. And, and that's how everybody knew me. So uh, I could introduce myself to to most people in Hamilton and, and they know who I was if I'd never met them before. It was a it, it was a really good infiltration. It's a shame it got compromised because we would have, uh, I think we were at about 200 people that, that we had substantive uh, federal charges on by the time we finished. So can you can you tell the audience, like at this point in 2005, six, what, what, um, who were at that point, we know who the Violis are now, Don Violi and Joey Violi are, are high ranking members of the Magadino crime family, even though they, they run the Hamilton along with the Lupinos, they run the, the Hamilton um, wing of it. But who, who were, who were Dom and Joey Violi in the 2000s? Sorry, Scott, so you cut out, say that again. I said, can you just tell kind of I mean, people know right now that Don Violi is the underboss and Joey Violi is a, a high ranking guy. Uh, but 20 years ago, who were the who were the Violi brothers? Like, what was your knowledge of them at that point? No, they were they were made guys. I mean, you've got to imagine you've got you've got Pat and Ange. Pat, Pat was a made guy. Mm -hmm. uh, Pat was a boss. Um, John Mastano, who's actually called um, Pino Avignon, was the yeah, that's cousin. A, right. Yeah. He's probably the brother. He's not the cousin. He's the brother. That's why he was so close to them. Um, but he was definitely a captain. And then you've got Vince Lombardo was captain. And you've got all these these players. Then you've got all the minor players. And uh, Violi was um, was a major player. He's always been a major player. He's, his old man was a stand-up guy. He was, um, he was killed. He, he, yeah, but it's the way he was killed. I think he, he knew he was going to be killed. He still turned up to the poker game. And uh, you've, They killed you've his uncles, too. They killed three, three of the Violi brothers. Yeah, yeah. You've got to admire that courage when you... Uh, but you know it's a setup, and you still turn up and, and take your take your licks. Um, there's not many people who could do that. So I think he's he's highly he's highly respected, and it's like I said, he's um, he's a smart cat. He's he's not somebody that would be easy to infiltrate. Uh, I met him twice. I met him up at Hardware Plus, which is was his store up on Nebo Road in Hamilton. Um, I was selling some uh, stolen uh, uh, for, uh, stolen flooring, and then I uh, met him in a bar called the Whistling Wal Walrus, and, and what. The idea was it was nine one one night, uh, and all the mobsters would go in and get the table at the uh, the front, and we'd sit there and watch all the cops come and go, and um, effectively catch faces. So uh, that was a bit panicky for me because I did know some police officers, and last thing I wanted was one of those guys walking in and going, "Hey, how's it going? Right. Uh, where are you working now? Which division do you work?" And, <laughs> yeah, I just have to run. Um, but no, he's he's a smart guy. He's a, he's a, a a very polite guy. He's uh, he's a dangerous guy, and I've no doubt in my mind that there's a good chance he's behind the, the homicides, the the pattern and homicides. Had you uh, were you surprised um, when the, all the stuff came out when he was arrested and there had been wires and we found out that he was the underboss of the, no. the Meganinos? You no. weren't surprised no, by that? No, not at all. Not at all. I'm surprised he's just the underboss. I thought I thought he might have been the boss, uh, or at least the boss in Canada. But no, um, he's he's definitely controlling everything from from. Ottawa. Well, he is the he is the boss in Canada. Wouldn't, we, wouldn't, we, wouldn't that be accurate? Well, yeah, he's a, he's a boss over. He's a boss in Ontario. I wouldn't say he's right. a boss. In, um, I'm not saying there. Canada is in Montreal, but yeah, yeah, but. that's a different crew out there. Completely right. different crew. I know, I know very little about those guys. Um. So who who at this time? I know I'm, I'm shifting groups here, but who from the hell who from the Hell's Angels were you working back then? Uh, Greg Birch, he was in charge. He was the president. Lou Malone, very close to Lou Malone. Uh, he was um, he, he was he was probably not the toughest. That was Andrew Briscoe, but he was probably the most dangerous character down there at the time. Uh, and I include Mafia in that. He was um, very very unpredictable, and Lou was very smart. He not his IQ, his IQ was negligible. Uh, he's street smart. He was probably one of the one of the smartest guys I've I've met when it comes to the way he deals with his um, his uh, personal security when it comes to policing. And so I I could buy drugs off Lou and uh, be sat in a room with him. 
having just bought drugs off him and bought off him 40 times before, and somebody else would come in to do bus- other business, and if that business was nothing to do with me, he'd literally tell you to fuck off. He'd get you out of the room because it's nothing to do with you. Right. And he's spot on. Why would you have all these people sat around knowing your business when you don't need to? Um, Lou, Lou had a reputation and uh, he got into it with uh, the Josh Bobbitt brothers and um, he was blackmailing them for money and he just got out of hand and they ended up shooting him in the face with a shotgun. And he bled out on Kenilworth, I believe, down in Hamilton. Um, so it doesn't matter how tough you are, the, 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 they can always get you in the end. And that's what happened with him. Where was where was uh, Nergit during this? So who? who? Where was Nergit? Uh, Walter's dad? Nick. You down in Welland. Different crew, completely. He was in jail. Okay. Yeah. What what was in jail? Uh, there's another character. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we know Walter. quite about we know uh, we know quite about uh, what what Nergit's role is and and how uh, infamous he is and. How he's uh, kind of a shadowy puppet master in that whole world. Yeah, there, 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 there's a few of them. I mean, K9 was was uh, over in jail. He was hanging around at the time, then he ended up in jail over in um, in Vancouver, I believe, uh, for planning to kill the Bacon Brothers, which were an organized crime group out there. Right. Um, uh, K9 was the one that, that everyone really worried about coming back. Um, uh, uh, you had uh, Americ Rourke, who was the president of the Outlaws before it was disbanded. Uh, he was another one that people feared. But uh, K-9 and Emmerich walked in on the, uh, the Hells Angels one day, and uh, there, was a, there was an issue that uh, I sort of got involved in. Um, and uh, somebody was beaten up in a bar by the Hells Angels. And he was beaten up because he said, listen, I'm a, a biker affiliate. And the guy that he said it to picked up the phone and, and called uh, Bubba Sherwood, James Sherwood, who was a patch member of the, the Hamilton Elves Angel at the time, I said, this guy's claiming to be one of yours. And uh, they went down and they, they kicked the living shit out of this guy. They put him in hospital. He was in a coma. He was just a mess. They stabbed him 13 times. An absolute mess. Problem was, he was a biker affiliate, but the outlaws and Satan's choice, and it was um, he was a close associate of uh, Johnny K-9. And you literally had a situation where a Mert Rock and Johnny K-9 walked into the Elves Angel's clubhouse, which was at Lonsday, um, Lotteridge at the time. And uh, threatened all the Hells Angels. Not just one of them, but all of them. Um, so two of them. And the, the entire crew was there. The Hells Angels crew was there. And, and they they submit. And they paid this guy off. And, and uh, um, he got a big check off them. And um, that was the end of it. But uh, Johnny Kane, I wasn't scared about going in and, uh, and roughing people up. Is... Um... Can you talk a little bit about the the actual murder contract that got put in your head? It, it, we think it came from the Bloods. No, so this is the this is the thing. We had um, a very good relationship with everybody. The Bloods that that came, the four that tried to kill me, um, the Reardons and two others that we never identified. Um, I bought off. I bought crack off them maybe thirty times, and that's not an exaggeration. Uh, they worked for a guy called C. Oh, no, sorry. They worked for Tony. C was a different crew. Uh, they worked for a guy called Tony, and they were moving a lot, a heavy amounts of, uh, of crack. And we found ourselves in a position where um, where we just stopped buying off them because it became pointless. We had so many offences on them. It, it wouldn't make any difference moving forward. Um, they just shot a guy up in... I want to say that was on Main Street as well. Uh, they took a shotgun to a guy, shot, shot off the back of his head. And he survived, Travis Bailey. Um, but that was mistaken identity. So they're just a nasty, nasty set of uh, individuals. And uh, they came at me on the patio, and I was outside on the cigarette, and it, uh, it just went off all four of them at once, and they told me they knew I was a cop. And, and it was just odd because um, um, I, I bought off them two weeks prior. They knew exactly who I was, so why the change, I don't know. They'd obviously been directed to me. Um, and then it was some years later when, when I pressed Lou Malone. Um, uh, that's when he turned around and said, yeah, you were sold out. You were sold out. So we, we I sort of knew at the time. I suspected at the time. It was a 20-minute fight. I don't know if you've ever been in a fight, but uh, a three-minute fight against another man's hard enough. But against four guys for 20 minutes, was it was a killer. 
I was I was banged and bruised up. Um, and I managed to make it back to the apartments after about eight minutes. Um, so get away from these guys and make it back to the apartment. And then uh, I called through to the handler. And he said, we'll have a cruiser outside waiting. Come and get me the UC car. Get the hell out of there. And then he called back and said, there's a cruiser outside. And I went out and it wasn't there. And those four guys were there and they started again. So um, I, I don't know whether I was set up twice, but it, it sort of sort of stinks. Uh, well, yeah, Lane, when you're giving when you're being sold down the river by the people that are supposed to be watching your back. You know what? It was it was hard because, I mean, in the UK, sometimes you don't even have a cover team. So you might disappear for three days, then you call into your handler and say, listen, I'm safe, everything's good, uh, and that's it. And then you do your report at the end of a seven-day period and because you don't need a cover team. Um, they're not going to do anything for you. It's like, it's like one, of the, one of the handlers said to me, well, we're not here to save you. We're here to avenge you. If anything happens to you, we're not going to be there. Really? But we will, get, we will get the guys that, 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 do, that do kill you, which is all well and good. But, I mean, one day we, um, we ended up going mobile uh, with a, a guy called... Uh, Angelo Gracie. Uh, he was a player way back in the day for Dominic Ostano and uh, pretty feared by everybody because uh, he's crazy. He'll, he'll put a bullet in you as soon as he'll talk to you. He's just, he's off the wall. And he says, uh, Englishman, come on, get in. So I jump in the car with him and I'm wired up and I'm like, where are we going? He says, oh, I'm not telling you. I'm just suspicious. He, he'd never take you anywhere. He'd just do coke all the time. And he drove us down to the, uh, the harbour on Lake Ontario and uh, there was a fish and chip shop there. And I thought, oh, he's, he's a dinner date. He's not going to kill me. Nice. Uh, we Pleasant surprise. Park. Yeah, we pulled into the parking lot and, uh, and he said cops. And I, I looked up because I was on my phone. I looked up. I expected to see a uniform patrol or something like that. And it was my entire fucking cover team sat in the restaurant eating. So um, the debrief that day wasn't pleasant. Let's just say we, uh, we fell out that day. Uh, they were drinking on duty. They were just, they were a mess. They really were. And it compromised you. If it, 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 it comp compromised me several times. I mean, yeah. what, one time we, we were making some drug deals. We were going to a place called, um, oh God, the Blue Martini on Hess Street. And that's where we'd always go, go and buy our coke. Then we'd take it back to my place. We'd cut it up and then we'd go and sell it at different bars. And um, we went down there and we went and cut it up and we went bar to bar to bar. I think it took about six hours. Um, financially, it's very good to be a coke dealer, just so you know. Yeah, the, mar the profit margins oh, are really yeah. high. Uh, as long as you get that baking powder in there, you, you really get yeah. a, a good ROI. Yeah, as long keep cutting it. Yeah. So um, I get back. Um, this is only a couple of weeks after the attempt on my life. I get back and uh, find myself in a place where um, I sign off and um, I've taken samples of the coke as evidence for charging in the, at a future date. And uh, I go home and nothing's said. The cover team don't say anything. I go home and my wife's in bits. I mean, she's absolutely, she's tearful. She knows what's happened with the attempt murder. Um, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And she said, uh, I got a call about five hours ago asking if you'd come home because they'd lost you. I said, what do you mean? I said, yeah, they called me. They said they'd lost you. They couldn't find you. I said, well, they called you back. I said, they found me then. I said, no, nobody called me back. So I called the handler and I said, what the hell? And he went, oh, yeah, we forgot to call back. We lost you for about four hours. So the, the competency, I mean, you got you got the OPP covering me sometimes. You've got Toronto covering me. They used to come down and help out um, from Toronto, which is about an hour and a half away. Um, their, surveil their surveillance team was shit hot. The Toronto surveillance team. The RCMP surveillance team never saw them. They were on me for days. They, they come and help out, never saw them. And the scientists, they... Uh, it turns out they were running. I mean, doesn't matter. They were they were running really good surveillance. Is, I'm is this tell you what they're doing, but they were they were doing really good surveillance. Paul, is this indicative of that region? I mean, because I know we're we're talking both sides of the border here, or at least in my coverage area. And what's going on in Buffalo right now is mind blowing in terms of this racketeering case where you're having witnesses die. Bon Giovanni. Uh, yeah, John, oh, Joe Bon Giovanni's on trial right now. Peter Gerace Jr., uh, Todaro's nephew, is going on trial in October. Yeah. Two witnesses have have died. One is considered a homicide. One's being investigated as a homicide. A Supreme Court judge died under suspicious circumstances who was an unindicted co-conspirator. The judge in the case, the original judge in the case, had to recuse himself because it came out 
well, it's come out more recently that his family had all these ties into the Tadaros. It just sounds like this this region, whether we're talking Western New York or uh, the Hamilton, Ontario region, it seems like it's like it's a wide open area where where it's like the 1800s or the early 1900s where law enforcement and 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 judges and politicians are like entrepreneurial not civil servants i i, I don't i don't think that's the case i mean it's like i like i said earlier it's um i i, I think i think buffalo's a, a, a satellite like a, a a management company for the golden mm-hmm. horseshoe um and when you're making that much money from the golden horseshoe i mean there's talk that every friday they'd make about three million just in hamilton alone from book um, and I can't see that being far off because some of these guys have laid down twenty, thirty thousand dollar bets. Um, with um, the Bon Giovanni case, I, I think we've already discussed that. I can't go into it, but I, I probably know more than most when it comes to uh, to that particular case. Uh, Homeland Security did a fantastic job. Uh, if I ever need a warrant writing or any kind of paper writing, I'm going to Homeland Security. Uh, they they do a fantastic job. I've never seen never seen paper like it before. Um, but, um, you've got to imagine all these offenses that are being charged, they're all bribery offenses. They're not, um, drug offenses or gaming offenses. He's not being accused of profiting from the drug dealing operations. He's being, he's being accused of taking money to protect the job. This is the thing. So there's, there's no, no substantive offense on these guys apart from the bribery. And that sort of lends to my theory that they're, they're not, they're not actually active in Buffalo. They're, they're just managing, uh, the golden horseshoe. Um, uh, also, the fact that all these people are dying, these witnesses are dying. I don't think we're, we're even close to being at the end of uh, end of that death list. I think uh, if you could put a dead pool together, you'll you'll make a, a few bucks. There's um... and it's been a lot. I mean, the the, the me, length of the of the uh, wheels of justice turning on this thing. The first charges were brought five years ago, and we're not even through the second of what will be at least three or four trials. Yeah. And that's, that's, this is very that, long. That's pretty normal because the, the, when you, when you do these organized crime investigations, especially when it involves corruption in law enforcement, um, Bon Giovanni has got the perfect, perfect, perfect defense, uh, in the fact that, uh, he's going to say, well, I never got proper discovery, but he's going to ask for things that, that he knows they're not going to give him. He's going to ask for things that he knows that the government are going to want to release. And not because they're, not because they're, um, uh, they show the government in a bad light. It's just because it's, it's sensitive policing techniques. Um, not that he doesn't know them all any, anyway, but they, they don't want to write them down and put them out there. Um, I think with the Bon Giovanni case, you really need to ask yourself what Bon Giovanni's position was within the Todaro crime family. Mm-hmm. Uh, simple the fact that killing all these witnesses and killing a judge and, and killing whoever they need to kill takes a lot of time and effort and risk. And that's yep. not one thing they're, they're interested in. And it would have been a lot easier just to kill Bon Giovanni if, uh, if the allegations against him are true. So with that and with, um, with uh, certain things that I've been told, I would suggest that Bon Giovanni might actually be made. Yeah, I've heard that as well. Um, it, you, know, you, know that, you know that he was very close with a lot of these um, guys in that world specifically a, a, a reputed soldier in uh, Mike the Gorilla Masekia, who I think was his best man at his wedding, or he was Mike's best man. But um, Mike is doing eight years in prison right now and is really the only made member of the Magadinos to get swept up in this until or unless Jerase Jr. is convicted. I know he's claimed to be a main guy, but we don't actually know if he is. Um, but I'd, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be shocked if he isn't. I'd, I'd be shocked. I know his dad. Um, I know his dad is for sure. Um, I again, I, I I refer to him as a self-professed made man in my reporting because he was uh, pretty open about telling people that. Yeah. Um, but w- I'm interested in your take on this. Also, it seems like it's been very savvy lawyering for his representation at the first trial. He was able to get a hung jury, not an acquittal, but to get a hung jury on the bribery charges by, they brought five people up to the stand that had been couriers and none of them could definitively say that the envelope they had been given to provide to Bon Giovanni had money in it. 
They just knew it was an envelope with something in it and they assumed it was money, but they never saw the money be put into the envelope. They never saw the money be taken out of the envelope. And he created at least a a strand of reasonable doubt that led to a, a hung jury there. What's your take on that defense? You know what? It feels like money. It's weighted like money. But you know what? They they knew it was money. Um, well, of course they did. I, I'm just I, talking I, about... I, yeah. I think that it, it's it's a lot easier to uh, to say, yeah, I didn't know what was in the envelope than just to take a bullet in the back of the head. Right. Um, and I think that that's that's the problem with these organized crime investigations. Uh, they can go on for years and years and years. Discovery can take two, three years. Um, you know what? There, you, you've got you've got. I think is the is he the state the federal district attorney Trippy? Yeah, uh, Trippy just got kicked off. Uh, one case uh, for prosecutorial misconduct in relation to the murder of the first witness, Crystal Quinn. And there's a question of whether or not he's going to be able to stay on the Gerace Jr. case. You know what? You, you've got these investigations. You're a crown attorney. The only reason, sorry, crown attorney, you're a district attorney. The only reason you're talking out loud to the papers about it is because you have political aspirations. There's no reason oh, for Trippy yeah. the, uh, uh, the interviews he gave. Um, uh, it seems like he he had uh, he had other aspirations. That 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 was the goal, uh, and that's that's when it starts to backfire. Because you know what, the mob you can talk about about them all you want. We can have this discussion. They they don't care. Um, but when you start telling them that you're going to put them in jail, then it starts to get twitchy. Yeah. Uh, and these guys, wise guys, when they get twitchy, they uh, they pull triggers. And and he like your to your point. He came into town, uh, I think in 16, got assigned there. And to, to exactly to what, what uh, Mr. Manning is saying, he started going on like a, a quasi media tour touting how he was going to go after the mob in Buffalo. And then he started to bring cases to a, a you know, in, trying to bring down an organization that had been pretty much ignored for 20 years. It ruffled feathers, and as you're saying, it's resulted in in this one case of where he's been kicked off the case for prosecutorial misconduct on his end. But then there's also word coming from the outlaws and the Kingsmen and the rare breed, which are the uh, one percenter gangs involved in this, that there's a murder contract on Trippy's head and a murder contract on um, U.S. District Court Judge Elizabeth Wolford's head. So this is like insane. Oh. I wouldn't that that wouldn't surprise me in the slightest. I mean, you, you got to the other thing is Trip is a, a hometown boy. He's from Rochester, I believe. Right. Um, and it, non-mafia Italians are actually pretty disgusted by the mafia. Right. They don't like it. They don't like the stereotype. They just they they think it's a cowardly way to live life. Um, some of our best investigators on organized crime are Italian. Mm -hmm. And not because they speak the language or they understand the, 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 the dialects or uh, they understand where these guys come from or they understand the family because they, they, they're they passionate about putting these guys in jail. Um, I think um, Del Conti was one of the better ones at uh, Hamilton Police. Even though I never worked directly with him on that, I worked a bit with him at the uh, when I worked for the RCMP, the uh, um, Combined Forces Special Enforcement Units. Um, when I worked there with him, he was very, very adamant that these guys should all be in jail and there's there's no there's no better pride than than putting mobsters in jail because they they they're a slur on your community um a trippy might be of a of, of an ilk where he's he wants to put bad guys away uh and he thinks that that shouting about it's the way to do it but with organized crime i tell you now shouting about it's not the way to do it it's uh slow and steady and as quiet as you can heads on the wall i mean you know and, and people that have been consuming my content, I'm 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 pretty um, adamant. And when I talk about law enforcement, and I, I got nothing but respect for anybody that that decides to go into law enforcement and and fight the good fight and and do stuff like Paul did. But I will also say, just human nature is human nature, and people are ambitious. And heads on a wall in terms of if you're an FBI agent or a regular detective in a local. Uh, police station or an attorney general. When you can put heads on a wall, that's what gets you promotions. That's what gets you uh, up up the chain. So uh, that's- That that and being good at hockey in Canada. Yeah. 
Well, and in, in, you know, to, to another, uh, to add on to another point of Paul's, some of the best FBI agents, DEA agents of the last 50, 65 years have been Italians trying to take down other Italians. And the two that come to mind that I, I have personal uh, relationship with, Frank Panessa, who is, you know, kind of the founding father of the DEA, uh, wrote the book on undercover work for the DEA. And he he spent his whole career going after Italians. And there's nobody more Italian than Frank Panessa. Uh, and then in Detroit, Lou Fischetti, um, who actually traced his roots back to the Chicago Fischetti brothers, who were with uh, Capone and Frank Sinatra. Lou Fischetti led the OC um, FBI unit in Detroit for 20 years. and he was the number one nemesis to all the major Italian mobsters in Detroit. One of their own was trying to take them down. And I know that there would be, you know, there's this kind of, uh, they understand in Detroit, it's something where both sides understand that the other side is doing their job and, it, and the animosity isn't as much as it is in maybe in other cities. But I know with Lou, you know, he would, he would sit down with these guys and some of these guys would be like, you're a, you're a, you're a traitor to your, your heritage like you should be on our team you shouldn't be on their team but it kind of speaks yeah, no. to some of that. uh the um uh, don't know how to pronounce it right carabinari out in italy yeah uh, effectively the military police uh yeah. they're they're very good at what they do when it comes to organized crime they really are and they, they don't fear these guys in the slightest um i think i think that when when you talk about contracts going out on people, and uh, it's very rare that somebody's going to take a contract out on on a, a district attorney, because uh, you can never put that in the, that homicide investigation to bed. Yeah, you can ne- you can never get rid of it. It's got to be done. I mean, look at look at Hoffa. Uh, they're still hunting for him now. And, and fifty years later, man, I do an interview about is it every this couple is the thing. days. They yeah. will, they will never put that investigation to bed. It's not going to be one of those that. Um, it's not like some homeless dude that got stabbed in the middle of the street and. It's, um, it's Personal. going to be one, that, yeah. It's going to be one they have to keep on the books and they have to keep investigating. And there'll be an office and there'll be a team. And uh, but the same with um, uh, with Trippy. I mean, they know the heat that's going to come if they. So sometimes they just put a rumor out, or, but no, it makes it, no it, sense. With the judge, and we still don't know exactly what happened with Mikulski. I mean, it's ruled a suicide, but there are still questions. You know, he uh, tried to step in front of a train. Uh, the year before, uh, Supreme Court judge in New York, um, but he was an unindicted co-conspirator. So not to say that it makes, whatever, I'm just saying that it was yeah. a situation where he was already like, according to the government, he was already in bed with the bad guys as opposed to Trippy and Wolford now yeah, who, yeah, are, yeah. who are, you know, uh, on the, yeah. you know, Team America. Or- he, he'd be my main concern. If I, if I was... Um- if I was part of a family, he'd be my major concern because he's the one that's going to flip. Sooner or later, he got indicted and he's the one that's going to flip. Well, he was going to be indicted. So just so you know, well, there you I don't go. Know, you know, so, the timeline on it, he, he, kill, or he killed himself like four days or three days after they raided his house. I, gar- I guarantee the EA or Homeland Security or whoever was dealing with it, I guarantee they paid him a visit and said, listen, come on board and we'll give you a new name and we'll, we'll buy a little McDonald's down in uh, Texas and you can live out the rest of your life and pretend you're uh, Frank Smith. Right. Um, so uh, that's, that's their most, most dangerous. I mean, it's not like it was 30, 40 years ago, at least how they tell me it was 30, 40 years ago. Um, the, the, the mafia that I was infiltrating, uh, the younger guys, my age now, but they were younger guys at the time. Uh, the way they deal with things and the way the, the old school paleo guys would deal with things, Frankie and Rocky, uh, just night and day. I mean, Frankie and Rocky won't talk to, to me about anything that, that had to do with business unless it was to do with my business. And the other guys would just chat away like they were uh, yeah. the old Polish women at the market. They, they, they would shut up. So um, I think with that and with the onset of, of technology and, and our new surveillance capacity, and uh, I think it makes it a lot more difficult for these guys to... Uh, um, uh, to operate, but that's where you come in, where where corrupt cops are, are very important. Um, cops, they get themselves in shit. They always get themselves in shit. Um, whether it's the nature of the job, or it's a tweet I put out today about PTSD and uh, and the, the things that affect us and, and how badly they affect us and how we respond. 
There's a guy called uh, Rosowski. He's a Hamilton police officer. And he's still got 16 charges outstanding. He's serving 12 years for a lot of other charges. And it all pertains to him selling information and, and, and selling out warrants. And So if you're a bad guy, you'd, you'd owe him 10 grand when, when he phoned you and said, uh, uh, you've got eight officers en route. So they've got a warrant. They're going to be searching such and such an address. Uh, they get all the stuff out of there or, or don't be there. But then when you, you do a bit, bit of background on this guy and you look at his history and you look at his uh, what a thief taker he was and what a, a good cop he was, it all changes. And it all changes around one date. And that's when uh, uh, when he first joined Gun, Gangs and Guns and, and he shot somebody in the head. Um, so I'm going to suggest that that was the catalyst for him, uh, him going off the rails. Uh, I'm not excusing in the slightest, uh, but... Um, uh, where was his support in that? Where was his uh, assistance? And, and I found the same when I finished working undercover. I was, uh, there was no deprogramming. I was, I was running with these guys for almost two years and, and we, we did some pretty nasty things and, and it was all legal because I, I was authorized to do them. But um, there's a feeling of power that comes with that lifestyle that you just don't shake. And um, you want, uh, you want a table, you get a table. You want something, a discount on something, you get a discount on something. It's, that's the way that world works. And it's pretty addictive. So I would imagine one cop takes one one bribe and that's it. They're done. The rest of the career, they're, they're owed by the Mafia or the Hells Angels or whoever owes them. But um, yeah, slow and steady and as quiet as possible. There's no reason to telegraph what you're doing, who you're going after. So Trippy sort of uh, lost himself in that. I don't know whether it was bravado or, like I said, there was some political aspiration there. Uh, but... Um, He's now in a position where he'll probably get bumped from everything, and um, well, they're uh, lucky they didn't get. The, they're frankly, they're lucky they didn't toss the case. They, they yeah, are. I'm saying you're lucky if you're the if the government. I'm saying yeah, they are. But um, cases cases rarely get tossed for for incidents like that. It's more where you you get police officers that are, are bending the truth, or their version of event differs from the truth when they're, they're giving evidence or. Uh, that's when you'll get a case tossed. But if it's procedural or if it's um, if it's a perceived um, conflict of interest that wasn't disclosed and it's genuine that, you know what, I didn't know I should have disclosed this year. In hindsight, I probably should. And it, it leads to a to um, uh, to a hung jury that, it's, that it is what it is. That's part of the game. Um, we've got to play it a different way than they've got to play it. They lie, they cheat. The bad guys, they lie, they cheat. The lawyers lie and cheat. And, uh, and they're, they're doing it to stay out of jail. And, we're doing it to put them in jail. and uh, Unfortunately, we've got rules to follow. And if we don't follow those rules, then we shouldn't be playing the game. Yeah. As, as we're wrapping up here, I just want to ask you one more question. And then I'll give uh, you an opportunity to tell everyone where they can kind of follow you. I know you got a, uh, some projects in the works that you're trying to get some attention to. And, and you've literally, you lived a movie script. You've lived 10. Um, what, and don't feel, if you don't feel comfortable answering this, that's totally fine. But I know from a from an intelligence perspective, being on the other side of the border to the United States, I'm guessing you have some insight into when you have whatever the, however it's structured between the Todaros and um, Lupino Papalia Violi, they are working together in some capacity. So they've got to be able to move across the border or relay messages across the border. Do you have any insight to how in this day and age that happens? Yeah, I know exactly how they're doing it. I know who's doing it for them. They've got, they've got couriers that will cross the border and pass on messages. Uh, one's a guy from Welland. One's a guy from Niagara Falls. We've got a couple in Hamilton. Um, they, they, they ask them to pass on messages. They go and pass on messages. And that's, that's how this has worked. Um, the, the, the thing about the, that particular border is you've got Seneca Gaming Casino on one side of the border in Niagara Falls, and then you've got Fallsview on the other. And it's not uncommon. It genuinely is not uncommon for people to cross that border five or six times a day going from casino to casino. Um, so you could have a, a very viable excuse. As long as you don't have a criminal record, you're not going to be flagged crossing the border. Uh, if the government are unaware of you, you're not going to be flagged. Um, I mean, one of these guys I, I spoke to, I sat down with him, I talked to him, I asked, I asked him what the hell he's doing. He said, oh, I'm just passing on messages. Um, and then he showed me a picture of Enzo, <laughs> who's the, uh, well, you know who Enzo is? Yeah. And so Enzo's the, the, Enzo's the, uh, the source that put Dominic Bioli away. Yeah. 
Um, it, they've got a picture of Molly Bakery together, all having a party. Um, Don Violi, Enzo, and a few other characters. Um, yeah, so th- there's got to be an open line of communication, and it's uh, it's old school. It's send that guy across the border, make sure he gives this message, and and that's it. Um, do, you not, do you not think that, or I, I guess I, I'm interested in this in general. Like, do do Dom and Joey Violi can they come across the border? And they yeah. have criminal records. They can't, no. right? No, not yet. They can get a pardon and come across, but the, it's going to the, the, they're looking at five years before they can get a pardon and then they can cross the border. But in theory, Joe Todaro, who doesn't have a criminal record, he can go across wherever the he wants. Right, wherever That's he wants. Right. So the night, the night, um, the night Johnny got white. Yeah, it was. It was the night Johnny got white. May ninety-seven. Pat and Ange crossed the border because I've got the customs records. Pat and Ange crossed the border um, into Niagara Falls, Rainbow Bridge. Uh, and then they came back a couple of hours later. Um, so, you know, sorry, it was the night before. Uh, and I would imagine that was them getting permission because they didn't do that without permission. Right. Their, their killing was nothing to do with revenge of Paleo. Paleo had to go. Paleo was getting arrested all the time. He was old. He was ill. He was infirm. He's um, pretty crusty. From my understanding, he's pretty crusty. He wasn't someone that took was, well to someone telling him to do something fuck with. Him. Right. He was still somebody that will fuck you up. He really was. But he was older. And, and I think the fear when they get that old and they're that sick, especially he had emphysema or, or some other thing. And, and there was talk of senility, which I've got his doctor's records as well. And there was no senility mentioned. And he was seen weeks before he, he was murdered. Um, I think when they get to that stage, they become a liability. And, right. uh, you know, at the end of the day, um, if Frankie and Rocky weren't involved in it as well, I'd be very surprised. Well, this was this was truly um, enlightening, and uh, you you just hit it out of the ballpark for for my audience. Thank you so much, Paul, no, for coming, thank you. sharing some insight. These are the kind of things that you really can't get in a even if you write even if someone like Paul writes a book that's still very one dimensional when you're reading it on a piece of paper, but when they come, someone like Paul comes and they talk about it and you, you see them viscerally discussing it and, and you can sense the emotion and you can sense the connection. It really gives a different level of um, perspective. And again, you've, you've, you've done it all. You've said it all. You've lived 10 movies. I hope one day soon we will, we'll be seeing uh, some type of uh, either television or film production on, uh, on the life that you led. It's already in the works, mate. Let's hope, Show man. Runners, showrunners are working it now. So uh, you can come back out. You can, out, you can come back on any time you want, but definitely when we have uh, some type of official deal on that, you can come back on and announce it. And uh, friend of the show forever, my man. Appreciate it. I really do. Thank you, Paul. Uh, this is the uh, OG Pod. This is what we do. We give you these great interviews and great insight, analysis, news. Uh, we don't do any of the drama. We don't get into the mudslinging. This is this is just. Uh, Straight news and analysis from the world of organized crime. Thank you so much, Paul Manning. Thank you, Benny, behind the glass. Scott Hunstein, OG Pod, I'm out.